Today's episode is brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor, as well as my favorite app for purchasing tickets to sporting events, concerts, and whatever else. Download the free SeatGeek app, use promo code BS, and get a $20 rebate off your first SeatGeek purchase. Every purchase backed by a 100% guarantee. It's the best and smartest way to buy tickets. Again, download the free SeatGeek app and enter promo code BS. Today's episode is also brought to you by LegalZoom, your best way to navigate the always complicated legal system. If you need help with incorporation, LLCs, trademarks, last wills, living trusts, and more, the smart choice, LegalZoom.com. Instead of expensive hourly rates, LegalZoom provides transparent pricing and customer reviews. So you know what you're getting up front. Plus you can get legal advice from their network of independent attorneys in most states. Enter BS in the referral box at checkout. You'll save even more. That's LegalZoom.com. Promo code BS and we're off. Yeah. Well, it hurts to have him on under these circumstances. <laughs> yeah. A podcast hall of famer in these circles. And now we're at odds. Tiny bit. Chuck Klosterman, controversial story in GQ this week, this month. Tom Brady, you don't really believe him. You don't totally believe him. What's going on? Not too much there. Although this must, this conversation must be boring for you because I'm not the president. I'm not even a governor. I know. How can hey. you talk to anyone now after sort of, you know, now that you sort of, your circle of, of influence now sort of... Uh, uh, moves into the, the highest levels of world domination. Yeah, the, literally the highest level. Is there a higher yeah. level than president? Well, there's the Bilderberg group. But. Yeah, I guess. Um, <laughs> hey, we should mention, I, I was really psyched that we're both on the cover of GQ. Uh, it's yeah, cool. That was, a, that was a, a, a neat surprise. Yeah. I feel like you knew about it before I knew about it. I, I got a heads up like last week. It's a good <laughs> good one for the old frame. Frame, I might frame that cover. Uh, I Yeah, I, I want to talk about the, the thing I did with Obama in a little bit, but we should talk about the Brady thing first. Okay. Uh, first of all, the Patriot fans are mad at you, I'm guessing? Well, I am getting some response from the Boston metro area. Yeah. That's about it, though. They're, they're, uh, they're a pretty uh, interesting fan base. Yeah. <laughs> interesting is, I would say they feel persecuted at this point. I... It, you know, I've talked about this before in the pod, but the flake eight has, um, it, it's really everything new England's about. It's the us against them thing personified. And there's a real case to be made that, that Brady got railroaded and, and that the ideal gas law, I think multiple people have proven that it totally makes sense that if you had the footballs at a certain level of PSI and then they were in cold weather for 90 to 100 minutes that they would deflate below the PSI level. Oh, um, it, it's possible, but I mean, I guess my feeling is this, okay? Yeah. I I start by asking him a question uh, from the Wells report, right? Yeah. And my assumption is that he's going to give the same answer. But that's sort of the baseline. You, I couldn't just go uh, start asking him questions. I had to go like, okay... So you uh, said you know you were not. It was the conclusion was that you were generally aware. You deny this. My assumption was that he would go, yeah, I, I was not generally aware. And then I could sort of ask the kind of more nuanced questions about his feeling about being put in that position, sort of how things sort of spiraled out from there. Uh, but he was unwilling to even answer the first question, which was so strange. Yeah. I shouldn't say it was so strange. It was strange only because, I mean, obviously I would not have done this interview if I was not under the impression that I could ask anything. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, he, he has the right to say, like, I'm not answering that. But I assumed that he would give the same response that, uh, that he gave before. Um, and and you, you need to have the, you know, kind of a baseline understanding of what you're talking about. But, and, he, and, you know, some people are saying... And and he would argue that, well, you know, there's ongoing litigation. This is an ongoing thing. I can't talk about this. Well, that's not true if you're giving the same response every time. I mean, it, it, it only it's only true if your response is changing. If you're accused of something, and you say no, you can always say no. True. And what's weird is that he gave a better and um, more detailed answer while he was under oath. 
it would seem like that is a riskier thing to do than to just do that with with some guy who's writing a feature about him for a magazine. And that's the part I don't understand. I actually, you know, I'm I'm friendly with Michael McCann who writes who's the legal expert for SI.com. And mm. by friendly, I just like we've emailed and DM'd a few times, things like that. And I was asking him like, you know, the like Brady took a real legal risk if it wasn't true that he didn't know anything about the whole Deflategate thing, because um, what really what it was is if if something now happens after the fact, then he can get dragged back in and stuff can happen to him because he wasn't totally honest when he was under oath. And I don't think people understand that part. Well, I mean, but in, in a sense, like is Rafael Palmero in jail? I mean, I mean, you really think that that they're going to allow basically Greg Hardy to walk the streets? And they're going to put an athlete away for something he said uh, about pretty arcane thing. I mean, the whole thing about this is that it's like a, a real low-stakes controversy that has sort of become a metaphor for something much bigger. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. The, the incident itself, would, even if, even if uh, it was irrefutably proven, uh, it's a negligible difference. I mean, I just how, how and the fact that he's played exceptionally well since this, it would seem to indicate that if there had been anything inappropriate, it certainly wasn't giving him an, uh, an advantage that he couldn't overcome in any other normal circumstance. Right. I, I guess my point is, McCann feels very strongly that there was a perjury risk for Brady if it comes out that he wasn't true and he was under oath, and that all comes down to whether the uh, the New York prosecutor's office decided to launch some sort of investigation. Now you'd say, well, why would they waste their time doing that? That's the kind of thing that prosecutor offices do do, you know, and you're seeing it now with the FanDuel and DraftKings thing um, with the attorney general getting involved, which I guess makes sense, but also seems like, you know, if you think about all the problems that we have in society week after week, it seems like a weird thing to go all in on daily fantasy. Like, ultimately, who cares if it's yeah, gambling I mean, or it's with, not with gambling? That, with that stuff, it seemed like initially there was conversation, you know, about like, well, is this gambling? How can they argue that it isn't gambling? And it did seem absurd that they had created this, this argument that, that yeah. it wasn't, yeah, this loophole that it wasn't gambling. But uh, what difference does it make if it is? Like what? What? Why? I, it's a, it's a strange thing. I think to to say that morally we need to stop this from happening. I'm not even really sure what the argument is outside of someone saying that it is wrong to gamble and people should not be allowed to gamble because we have to protect people from their self and they'll they'll. Wasn't well, that the argument though? Like if sport, if you can't gamble on sports legally in this country unless you're in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's it's. Then it's why would of, you then be able to gamble on? a team that you put together of players' performances that is basically gambling. It's just sort of like we have this pre-existing law. You have this pre-existing law you can only gamble on sports in yeah. Vegas, and it makes no sense. Wait, we got we got off track. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to get bogged down in Deflategate. The thing that I'm interested in, well, two things. First of all, why did Brady and his camp agree to give you this interview and tell you that everything was on the table? And, and that was what appealed to you about doing this interview. It's like, oh, that's awesome. Everything's on the table with Tom Brady. I have to do this. And then you do the interview and everything's not on the table. Why would they change their mind on that? Well, it is a, it's a, it's a kind of a complicated thing. Now, obviously, and, and just to explain this to people listening, when these interviews are set up, uh, GQ has someone called a Wrangler, and the Wrangler is the person who makes contact with Tom Brady or Jay-Z or whoever they're talking to. And, of course, the person like Tom Brady is represented by their agent. Well, either the people around Tom Brady or Brady himself wanted to be on the cover of the Man of the Year issue. Yeah. They obviously thought this would be something that they would want to do. I don't know why, but like they, they like thought this would be a great thing. Uh, an important thing for them. Um, but, of course, in order to do that, they can't just say, we want it. There has to be uh, an, you know, the, an interview that goes with it, and I'm not going to do an interview unless I can ask whatever I want. Like I say, people don't have to answer those questions, but I'm, I would never agree to an interview with limitations. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't, of course, involved with the conversation during the construction of this, you know, of this meeting or whatever, but... Uh, uh, 
it appears, from what I have been told, that and I can't. I don't want to go too specifically because, like I say, I don't. I didn't. I don't know the wrangler. I don't know the agent. These are just stories that I've been, that have got back to me. That essentially, that they were like, this. Everything is on the table. This will. He'll. He, this interview will be. You know, like like uh, the the kind of the ultimate explanation for this. You know, this entire controversy. Right. So I'm like, great. Well, then I'm going to go there, yeah, and talk to him in person, and that gets changed. And the so idea- you're supposed to see him in person. And then you got the the runoff, basically. Yeah. Well, first they they made sure the photo shoot happened. See, that was part of the weird thing. It's like they, I don't know if, if this is what happened, but it, to me, it almost seems as though that they made sure that uh, GQ had these pictures of of Brady in his house and everything was set up for the cover, and then maybe decided uh, actually or decided or never intended to actually talk about the things that I want to talk about. And obviously I'm going to ask those questions. There's no way that you can do a piece on Tom Brady and not sort of discuss the most interesting controversy of his career that's right. still sort of ongoing. You know? Yeah. I'm with you. And I'm trying to think about it from, from his end. Like if you had told me, yeah, and you kept this a secret from me, just like I kept the secret from you that I was doing the Obama thing because there was all these different concerns that things would get out, all that stuff. If you had told me you were doing this during the season as somebody who's followed Brady since he got the starting job in 2001, I, I feel like I've met him. I know people who know him. I feel like I have a pretty good handle on how he thinks. I would have said there was no way he was going to say anything interesting to you in that interview during the season. Like, I think if it was April you might have had a chance. But during the season, he wasn't going to distract the team, which is so weird that whatever was insinuated that he would give this tell-all interview, basically. There's just no way. He doesn't do stuff like that. Well, sure. Here's what I assumed would happen. I assumed I would ask that first question, which wouldn't even appear in the piece if he answered it the way I anticipated, which is I'd say, like, were you generally aware of this? And he would say no. Yeah. And then I had a whole bunch of other things I wanted to ask him about from the premise that this is something that he had no knowledge of and that suddenly he was in this world where his coach seems to be somewhat uh, suggesting that, that if there's any questions, they should be directed at him. What, what point did he realize what these accusations actually mean? Why he was talking to, the, uh, to the, the team managers on the phone? Did he have any relationship with them before this? What were they talking about? Was it him calling them or was it them calling him, essentially telling him what went on? I had all these other things I was interested in, um, but he just was not going to even sort of recognize that this event had occurred. And you and your takeaway from that is this is super weird. And it made me you went into it not totally having an opinion, it sounded like, and you came out of it thinking, This is really weird. I wonder if he did this. Well, I guess I assumed going into it that um something strange here has happened, but I don't know anything. I haven't talked to the guy. I just have I know the same things anyone else knows, you know. I watch television and read the internet and all that. I felt his responses seemed to suggest the responses of a person who was guilty. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, like, I, 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 my opinion. I mean, I, I think I make it pretty clear that this is my perception of this. Yeah. But it, it seems like there's too many weird details here. I, I guess this is part of it as well. It's such a strange thing to be accused of that if you had no knowledge, your response would be like, of course not. That never occurred to me. Why, the idea of deflating the balls, why would I do that? I was shocked by it. That doesn't seem to be the way he or the organization are responding to it. And I feel like the ESPN, the magazine story, sort of about how this would have happened and how this was, in all probability, some sort of attempt by the NFL to penalize the Patriots for things they were believed to have done but yeah. could never be proven to have done. I think that that's a, a very you know probable explanation for this and we agree that the premise behind that espn the magazine story i think is is pretty accurate i i think the way goodell reacted i i, I don't want to go over this ground again i feel like i've talked about it before but i i do feel like the way goodell reacted this entire time was actually a reaction to eight years of his relationship with Kraft and how it was perceived by the other owners i i do feel like that was a huge part of this where it was 
just owners constantly tweaking him. Come on, man. Again, really? The Patriots again, you and Kraft? Like, why don't you just make him the commissioner? And all these little barbs. And I think he just snapped. I was like, I'm going to show these guys. I'm going to treat the Patriots oh. as hard as I treat everyone else. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that's probably very true. And I also think someone else uh, who sort of, uh, I'm not going to say who because I don't want to give this away, but somebody who sort of knows some of the things that have gone on here said to me that, he believes that Brady was just terrified that if he admitted any wrongdoing in the wake of the Colts game, yeah. that he could get suspended for the Super Bowl. So he was like, I'm going to do what I can to get to that game. I'll say whatever I need to say to get to that game. And once that had happened, there was sort of no going back. That right. He just to, that, that, you know, it's, it's – I and, and the larger thing that, that I'm writing about in this piece is that I – over time, this is this is not going to matter. It's not going to seem the way it does now. It's going to seem like this kind of quaint, almost charming thing that happened during this period of the Patriots dynasty, and will sort of explain why they are such a dynastic institution. I mean, it's just I think that they will go a little further than the other teams. Yeah, and I and it, the best explanation that I would have as a Pats fan for Deflategate is that. I think Brady liked the balls in the low end of whatever the legal limit was and made it clear to his dudes, like, you know, keep it, don't have them too tight. And those guys knew that. And that was it. And I think he yelled at them of like what, a couple months before after that Jets game that the balls were too inflated and was really mad about it. And that kind of set the tone for how they then treated the balls. I just think that I've said this before. I, I don't want to sound like like uh, Phil Sims. You know, Chuck, we talked about before. We talked about. But I do feel like uh, the, that when the balls deflated maybe a little bit less than what was legal, not a bad thing. Maybe Brady was like, that's that's fine. But I don't think he was thinking about PSI. I think that's the most complicated job in sports. And to think that he had time... He, that he even had the extra bandwidth to say to himself, you know what I really care about right now is whether the balls are 10% less inflated well, than they but, should be. It's just, yeah, it doesn't thinks, add up to me. Nobody thinks that, that he was actually like, telling these guys, I want the PSI level to be this. To be slightly lower that, than legal. I, I think he was just like, as low as you can make it. Yeah, and they, I think he probably did like, say that. And maybe they said like, well, like a little lower than he's just like, make it as low as you can make it. Yeah. You know, yeah. And that sort of, and so like is that a form of uh, of cheating? Well, yes, it is. I mean, in the same way that you know when, when uh, uh the Seahawks play defense, they they basically commit interference and seemingly are hold on every play knowing that yeah. it can't be called every play. Okay, is that a form of cheating? Yes. But I mean, some of these things are sort of ingrained in the way these sports are played, and we actually kind of reward the people who push those boundaries, and that's going to happen to the Patriots too. I, I mean, in, in, a, in a larger sense, you know, I've, I haven't done a ton of, of interviews this year. I've done like four interviews: Brady and Kobe, and Taylor yes. Swift and Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, and that's in, quite a foursome. Well, but the thing is, in both cases, they really sort of show the different poles of how you can perceive why you're involved with the media at all. Like Kobe saw this as an opportunity to be like, I think my legacy really matters. I need to shape it. Brady is, I'm going to give nothing to anyone. And, and that m my legacy basically will be almost an impossible thing to shape because all you'll have um, are the tangible things that happen on the field. Eddie Van Halen looks at doing an interview with a media person as sort of a way um, to kind of almost damage the way the music is consumed. In other words, it's like, why do I want to say anything about these songs? I would rather have just the songs exist so that the consumer has no other filter to influence what they hear. Taylor Swift is more like, well, the songs and who I am as a person are equally important and that I need to intertwine these in order to have it have the maximum effect. So... With Eddie Van Halen and Taylor Swift, it's generational. With Kobe and Tom Brady, it's more like ideological. Yeah. Right. It's a tactical move that perpetuates some sort of public image that they're trying to protect and cultivate. Right? I 
guess. I mean, yeah, that, that's got to be part of it. But it, 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 in some ways, it's like it might be even less sophisticated than that. It might just be the difference between thinking my views on myself matter as opposed to uh, I don't even think about myself. What does that? Who, who cares what I think of myself? Like that's Brady almost seems that way. Like he doesn't. He, he, he just it's it's almost as though he doesn't even really value his own insights into himself because he never seems to give them. I think I guess I, that's unfair. He might I, that's that's unfair. He I, just because he doesn't give them doesn't mean they don't exist. Yeah, yeah, but, no, yeah. I I don't think he cares. I think he just wants to play football and win games, and that's how he wants to be judged. And from what I know about him. That's all. That's all his life is constructed to do is to win football games. Everything about him. I wrote about this last year when I did the Brady versus Manny piece. Like every decision he makes is based on his football career. Like for what he eats, to how he trains, to how he sleeps, to what time he goes to bed, and he trains all the time. All he wants to do is play football and stay good at football and be the best quarterback of all time. He doesn't really have any other hobbies. Well, okay, and and. That being the case, why would anyone then be shocked by the possibility that a person whose entire life is consumed with success at one thing would not perhaps take advantage of a, um, uh, a, a not little perfectly loophole. legal advantage yeah. to succeed? I mean, that would be like using Kobe Bryant as an example. Would it be remotely shocking if we were to find out? That Kobe Bryant had done something mildly illegal to help him be a better basketball player. Oh, now player you're speaking my language. Like oh, I love this conversation. I mean, of, of let's course. keep this going. Yeah. Well, he did go to Germany when it wasn't legal in the United States to fix his knee. Sure, but that, but, but nobody cares because that's there's no rule against it. But because of this, this football thing, because there's this bizarre rule that the teams are responsible for their own football. Yeah. And this, uh, you know. Th and I suspect, I'm not 100% certain on this, but I strongly suspect the reason that every team is responsible for their own football is probably going back to something that happened in the 60s or 70s where there was a fear that if you gave the home team the ability to control this and you had a game in Oakland or whatever, you were going to end up with these weird footballs that, you know, so they were like, well, let, we'll let every team sort of keep uh, track of their own equipment so that uh, to create a more level playing field, and then this idea, I gotta say, when I, when this story broke, tell me if, if you were the same way. When this story broke, the Deflategate thing broke. Has it ever occurred to you that this might be happening anywhere? No, I, I had never thought of this idea. Now I, that doesn't mean just because I haven't thought of it that it's it's ridiculous. It just means that it isn't the kind of thing that seems like a um a like. <laughs> It was I'm, so weird. The, I'm with the you. Weirdness almost gave it credibility. It was such a. It would be like if I accused you of having a popular podcast because you were compressing the audio sound, and this gave people the illusion that they were enjoying it more than they were. I mean, if, you know, it's, that's it's I do that though. That's that's actually yeah. true. Well, you see, um, <laughs> but wait a second though. The the Homer Patriot Fan of America Committee is is telling me that I'm obligated to mention that there's no actual real proof that the balls were deflated. Because the ideal gas law explains everything. The balls were tested incorrectly. And you could make a case the Colts also had deflated. Like, nobody actually knows which balls were deflated, what, how much they were deflated by. The gauges were different. Like, it, there's, it was such a mess. It was almost like, like how they botched the OJ crime scene multiplied by a million. Well, you know, uh, Bill, that's a great counter. So I'm curious. Are you then arguing? that you cannot accuse someone of lying without proof. <laughs> well, do, but do you think Brady... <laughs> it's, fair, it's a fair point. Yeah, you're saying... <laughs> that was good. I guess that's true. I guess... It, are we agreeing that you can never... I mean, maybe that's a reasonable thing to conclude. I think with the, with the Goodell thing, though, I felt like I had way more proof... Than, than people actually had with this Brady thing. The problem with the Brady story was how it was reported coming out of the gate, set the tone for what everyone thought. And you saw this happen twice. And I actually thought this was a pretty scary sign for just how, how media and reporting is consumed in America in 2014 and 2015, where an incorrect report comes out 
everybody then proceeds as if that report is true for the next few weeks and months. And then it turns out, oh wait, that the report has a million flaws. And then when it comes out again, that Brady quote unquote destroyed his cell phone, that whole thing, then that becomes a narrative for two weeks. And then it turns out that that report had flaws. I, it scares me. You know, this is this is the but, problem with the fact that we have such reliance now, all of Western culture really, on the idea of storytelling and narrative. Because whatever is the first story or whatever is the first narrative, just because it's the initial one, kind of calcifies and galvanizes in people's mind. And any alternative story not only has to supply a reasonable explanation – but disprove the original narrative, even if that original narrative was fake. It's, it, I mean, and it happened to me last year, which is, yeah. or the, earlier this year, which is one of the reasons that, you know, I've noticed it probably a little more than most is whatever the first thing that comes out is, especially now with, with how social media works and the snowball mentality of just anything, any news at all, and the snowball rolls down the hill and it becomes this giant snowball. It's scary. And the flake gate was innocuous. You know, it's freaking stupid. Who cares? Um, but this is something that does seem to happen over and over and over again. The first narrative is always what sticks. And it doesn't matter if it's true or not. And I don't like it. Well, yeah. I mean, and the problem is whatever the first narrative is, even if it becomes like, a, like obviously false, every time the story is reported, there needs to be um, someone saying like, well, uh, you know, initial reports though did claim this. Like they keep repeating the falsehood because it was false in order to, to suggest that, you know, this is something that we got wrong. Right. Uh, you know, I, you know, the, here's a, it, it, and it ends up sort of making that the, the only one that really sort of remains in people's mind because everything else is just a reaction to it. And then the, the, you see this happen sometimes, especially when it's an angle that, has a little sophistication to it, but it's wrong and people repeat it because they don't know any better. Um, not to bring ESPN into this, but they, there's been this angle for the last few months about cord cutting, how this is a huge problem for ESPN. And, you know, and this is why people like me and Jason Whitlock and Colin Coward are, were decided not to be kept by ESPN because of, because they had to save money now and all this stuff. If you go down individually, like my situation had nothing to do with money. Coward get, just got a better offer from Fox and the Whitlock thing self-combusted. So those three things had nothing to do with money. Oberman show just didn't do well, didn't rate well. And they decided it wasn't worth it. That's not a cord cutting thing. Yeah, I know. It's like, I know we really haven't, we haven't really talked about this on a podcast. We've talked a little bit kind of, you know, off air, but you know, it is, interesting like what happened with Grantland. I got to say that yeah. in the 20 some years that I've been involved in the media, this is the first time anything that dramatic happened that had no relationship to money at all. And I just think that the fact that occasionally stories would still like, I mean, the idea of talking about, you know, traffic, there were like this whole idea of like the traffic of Grantland and then like, you know, did it go up when you were away? They kind of tried to use the numbers to yeah. kind of, you know, but the thing is, like, if, if that was never an intention of the site. If, if anything, I felt I got uncomfortable with how big it got. I thought it was supposed to be smaller, and that the idea was that when you're a company that large with that much money, you can do things that aren't necessarily profit-driven. And you know what? As far as I could tell, that was the case. I feel as if though your if, if your relationship with ESPN had stayed the way it was in 2009 or 2010, Grantland would still be running exactly as it was right now. Nothing would be different. You'd still be there. Everything would be the same. Yeah, we'd probably have a little more, because we were just still figuring out how to do certain things, you know, especially from a social media strategy standpoint and apps and things like that. Yeah, it's the thing that people, the revenue thing is just something you throw out when you don't want people to understand like the real reasons why something happened. Because you could pick apart all the revenue sources for ESPN. I mean, they spent $125 million on the Sports Center set three years ago. When you talk about, um, I don't want to turn this into a bashing ESPN set, I'm just pointing out facts. They spent $125 million on the Sports Center set. They paid a ton of money for NBA rights 
they spent money in a way that they assumed that whatever advantage that they had from 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, they assumed that that advantage was going to remain the same for the next four, five, six, seven years. And they were wrong. And what they didn't count was that the subs that they had were going to go backwards and we're going to start going down and that people 25 and under and even some adults were just not going to have cable and satellite. They assumed that the 100 million subscribers that they had in 2012 and 2013, whatever year they got to 100 million, they assumed that that was going to be the case in 2018. And all of the bets they made in 2011, 2012, 2013 were based on that subscriber number. And now it went backwards and it continues to go backwards. And cord cutting is a real thing. And for them, it's like, you know, you pay, guess what you pay for ESPN? You're paying 75 bucks a, a year, I think. It's like six fifty a month. Maybe it's eighty bucks a month. You're worth eighty bucks a month to them. If you said screw it and you just got rid of cable, they lose eighty bucks from you. And what's happening is they drop from I think a hundred million to under ninety two million subs. So eight million times seventy five dollars a year. Uh, that's a lot of money. And they and I don't think they ever saw it coming. I really don't. I listen. I was really embedded in there for a few years. I never heard anyone really talk about the subs being a concern until the end of 2014. What so the, the subs, what are you talking about? Subs is like people who subscribe to ESPN. Oh, sub, okay. Yeah. So if yeah, you have cable I mean, or satellite, I, I, you're worth $6 and 50 cents a month. Now somebody like Tate, Tate, do you pay for cable? Kate just shook his head. He doesn't pay for cable. So that's 75 bucks a year. They're not getting cause Tate's like, you know what? I'm just going to stream stuff when I watch TV and I'm going to watch Netflix and I'm going to watch iTunes, all that stuff. They didn't have a plan for this whole next generation of stuff. And that is what's determining their choices. It's not about a couple of people that work for them. This is about, they were spending a lot of money and now they're like, oh crap, we're not bringing in as much money as we're, as we're spending. But the reality is they're still making a ton of money. They're just not making quite as much money as yeah, they made I mean, two years ago. This is a problem at, at ESPN, but it's a problem in lots of places. It's just the idea that if you have a successful business, you were obligated to make it more successful. Yes. Like I mean, you're I, supposed to I, compound I, I the to, success. I kind, of, I kind of disagreed with the idea of when when, when Grantland was trying to get bigger. I wasn't really sure why. Like I, I don't, I didn't really understand what the what the the motive for that is. Outside well, what do you mean of, get bigger? Because it's not like we were adding writers. No. I mean, I, I, mean, I think we it wanted. It seemed as though there was a concern to to sort of increase the reach. And to, no, it wasn't. It wasn't an increase to reach. Well, because it was, why would you like all that? Did you know, like the mobile stuff, like that? That's an attempt to to increase the reach. I don't think increase the reach is the right word. Although that is a great name for like a rock band or something. <laughs> um, no, it was more a case of you want as many people to read a piece as possible. You just want them to be able to access it. Yeah, but that's a semantic thing. That's increasing the reach. I'm not talking. Yeah, about but if rock you write a, if you write an awesome piece, I want as many people to be able to see it as possible. Just because I like the piece. I don't, it's not a case of, we, I mean, we never did this stuff like uh, gaming the headlines and all that. We just sure, never did that sure. stuff. But so, I mean, but okay, go a little deeper on that. Why do you want that? Why, why do you want the maximum number of people to see something if you think it's good? It's not a maximum number. It's a case of. Or the largest possible number. Yeah, if we, but you're still making it seem like we're like McDonald's. I, I think it's. If if you have good content, you want people to be able to know know about it and see it, and you know there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. Um, for us, I, guess, I mean, I know you're, I'm not making it sound. That, no, no, I know, but, I know, but, but what I'm just saying is that I I I have found in my in sort of my experience that that there is a downside to increasing the amount of people consuming your work. If you start getting beyond what the natural size of the audience is, yeah, I agree with that. That there's like a, you know, how many? I mean, okay, did not uh, here again. I don't want to get off on a tangent, but okay, like so, so like okay, like so. Brian Phillips covers the Iditarod, right? Yeah, and and he go, goes up there and spends a bunch of time, costs money to be up there. Where it's an eight thousand word piece, you know, it's uh, like a uh, as an editor, uh, maybe two editors, just a design person. Now, from a traffic perspective, you probably do about the same amount making fun of the I did or out in your apartment. Yeah, but that's. Like saying, but you don't like do saying, that story for traffic, though. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. 
also, uh, there's a limited number of people who actually want to read an intelligent, sort of complicated story that's 8,000 words long about the Iditarod. And it's, I felt as though that, that there's, there's just always this goal in all publishing entities to sort of get beyond the natural size of your audience. And I think that, that when now, I hold on, I'm going to fix this for you because you're actually wrong on this one, but I'm not, I'm not mad about it. The, we, the issue that we had was that we had created a site that was built for desktop computers. You know, everything about it in 2010, 2011 was the concept was you can read this on your laptop or your desktop computer. We did not know iPads were coming. We did not know that the, our audience was going to move onto people's iPhones and things like that. And what was happening was by the end of 2014, over half of the people that read ESPN were reading it on mobile devices. And we weren't prepared. We, our site, we didn't even have an app. You know, we just weren't, we weren't prepared for that world. It would almost be like if you're a restaurant and all of a sudden the town you're in is like, Hey, half of us are gluten-free and you're like, Oh crap. Well, we, we don't have any gluten-free dishes. Sorry. So we weren't accommodating those people. And that was the issue. It's it was like, kind of a, it was really a mechanical thing. It was a mechanical thing. Yeah. It wasn't like a, how do we increase the reach? Cause if we want to increase the reach that, you know, there's little tricks you can do for us. It was just a case of society moved in a direction that we're not prepared for and we have no plan for it. And that's a, that's a different problem. And that, that comes down to resources and game planning and stuff like that. And we just weren't ready, you know? And, and that's also a situation where you need help from your parent company and you need, you know, help from your bosses and you need to come up with plans. And, and that, that was where we were having issues. So like to not have an app in 2014 is insane. You, you, you need something. That's true. Um, so anyway, that was the issue with that. But um, I forget how we got on this topic. Oh, I think we were just talking oh, about, about the Grantland thing. Yeah, you, you, you were, you were. I don't know. You're a Vulcan. Sometimes you were, you were about as, uh, you were pretty emotional about the Grantland thing. Well, yeah. I mean, it was uh, that was a, an interesting period in my life, and I feel like that uh, that it. Uh, it didn't sort of work the way I imagined it, but I still felt very emotionally invested because of the period at the beginning and the fact that I knew so many people involved. And Well, you um, were also, you, you won't say this, but you were a huge part of the planning with the site, um, some of the people we hired, the, the general conceit of what we were trying to do. I mean, you, you were one of the most valuable people we had, which well, I don't was, think a lot of people know. It was a... It was an interesting thing. I, I mean, I, I, I feel like that uh, the very first meeting we had about that at that Italian restaurant. Yeah, a million a, years I, ago. I really remember that dinner. Yeah. Um, that was, you know, uh, but so was I, I, I guess I was, a, I mean, but at the same time, it's like what, uh, I can't, you know, what, what, how, how, what am I supposed to do with just something that happened? Wait, we didn't talk about. The, uh, the, my Obama thing. Yeah. The, uh, so now, uh, when you were going into that interview, did yeah. you say to yourself, like, okay, I almost have to sort of pick a lane on this. I mean, I have to either sort of be real political or sort of look at him as a person, try to really try to, to get the, like the person that is unseen as we see the president or did, did you have any sort of, uh, I guess, plan going into it over, over oh, how yeah. you would approach this? And what was the plan? I had a total game plan, and it turned out to be the wrong game plan. And fortunately, we were able to audible into, um, I, I thought it turned out to have a lot of good nuggets in it, but my initial plan was to talk to him about the era and about leadership and what he learned about leadership. I was really interested in that. Like, how did he learn... When he was a leader in 2008 versus what he, what in 2015, what did he learn over the course of those seven years about, you know, what would he do differently? Um, what factors came in things like, you know, Twitter becoming a thing, like what, what changes in society made his job more difficult? What, what left him unprepared? Things like that. And what I didn't count on was we weren't taping it either with video or audio um, as a podcast. So it was basically just me and my tape recorder. And 
he used that to his advantage. So the first couple answers were, you know, we edited that, that the, the real transcript of that interview is probably, you know, how this works. It was probably like 10, 11,000 words. And you, then you cut it into, um, yeah, I think it was a 5,000 word piece. That was the space they had in the magazine. So you, you basically take it from a porterhouse steak to a filet and you put the best parts in, but his first, his first few answers, like he, he almost filibustered. It was really smart. And I, and I, and I was so mad at myself. I didn't anticipate he was going to do that because the last time I, I had it with him, it was this back and forth, really lively 20 minute conversation. It was a lot of back and forth. There wasn't any long answers on his part, any of that this time around, he took his time and he thought carefully about everything he was going to say. And my issue was you're interviewing the president. Normally if I'm interviewing, I don't know, you or some actor or some athlete, whoever, I'd start jumping in to kind of move it along and get more back and forth, but you can't interrupt the president. You know, it's just weird. I'm, I'm, I'm playing a road game in the white house on his turf. It's your, it's a little disarming. Anyway, you got a lot of adrenaline and for about 15 minutes there, I'm like, I have no control over this. <laughs> like this, he's just talking and I have this whole agenda in my head and in the back of your head, you're going, I have probably 45 to 50 minutes total. And now we're at minute 16. And I haven't gotten to anything I wanted to get to yet. And uh, so then gradually I was able to start pushing it in the right spots. And But that, with that interview, I think everything that was in that GQ interview, like 90% of it was from the last half hour of the interview. And the, the smartest thing I did was so I had a speed were, how round. Long were, how long were you there for? I was there for 50 minutes. But the smartest thing I did was I had the speed round thing ready to go. And I actually pulled out my iPad and I was just firing questions at him. And... Now, if I had to do it over again, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think I would have maybe done it, maybe said like, this is going to run out as a podcast at some point. So he would have had to feel more urgency. I thought the way he handled it was really smart. It explained a lot. The guy's just smart. You know, yeah, he's like, yeah, I think he comes across very well in it. And, yeah, he does. You know, one thing that, uh, that the piece made me think about, and I'm wondering what you think about this. I mean, okay. So you've, uh, you've interviewed Obama three times. You've interviewed the president three Twice. times, right? Twice? Yeah. Okay, twice. Um, Andy Katz seems like he interviews him every year for the NCAA tournament. Yeah. Uh, Obama went on the Zach Galifianakis little between two ferns thing. Um, you know, he, uh, he went on Mark Maron's podcast. He did all of these things that uh, that no president had ever come close to doing before. I, there's no, I mean, you know, uh, Clinton went on the Arsenio, Arsenio Hall show, but that was before he was elected. Right. Here's what I'm wondering. These sort of non-traditional media sources, people who are essentially involved in sports or comedy or, you know, or, or you know, is this what presidents are going to do now? Like, is the expectation going forward that when you become president, you will do all the traditional media things? But in order to sort of reach the audience that, for whatever reason, and many of them for multiple reasons, have sort of given up on mainstream media sources, yeah. Uh, you know, do you uh, need to do that? Or will this be a kind of a, like a, an outlying thing that Obama was different for so many reasons, but he did these things. And when the next president, you know, probably Hillary, but whoever, will they sort of return to the way things were before? Or is this just going to be part of the presidential experience now? I think he's an outlier. And it, the, the thing, one of my big takeaways from the two times we went there to, to do an interview with him was the people who worked for him talking about how excited he was to do this. And, and even like, I know a couple of people that work for him or whatever. And I think he's really, really, really bored by how conventional and polarizing the, the, the political media is. And I, I just don't think he likes it. I don't think he likes how when he has to do an interview, he knows half the people who, who read it or consume it are going to feel one way about it. And the other half are going to feel another way. And it's, it's going to be the same questions every time. And he's going to have to figure out new ways to, to inject life into something he's answered a million times. But then when he sees like something like me, he's like, Oh great. This guy might ask me about Michael Jordan. I, I, I just think it, it makes it more interesting for him. I, I I think that the, the thing you were talking about, how how the part he doesn't like, I think that what he realized, and which is 
you know, not not going to shock anybody, but uh, but I think that he 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 really realized was the fact that uh, those the traditional things when you address the the country when you address the media, um, they are completely inhuman interactions. Yeah, you're essentially you're, you're giving a set of talking points that uh, exist so that a portion of the populace can accept them and a, a portion can disagree with them, and it almost has nothing to do with you and the way you actually are. It's a collection of compromises you had to make, and yeah, you know, and and in these interviews, when you when you talk to him or when Marin talks to him or whatever, he's going to be asked a question outside of that, where the question will really be about him. And, you know, it's like, a, I mean, you don't become president unless you have some ego. I bet he probably is like, I want people to, to sort of ask me about, you know, what I think about Roger Goodell. Like, why does everyone else get to comment on this and I don't? I can't just come out and say these things. If he just, you know, if he right. just called, a, you know, suddenly there was a, uh, you can't call a press conference to talk about something that interests him. He's just got to wait for opportunities for people to ask questions that are actually about him as a person, which would never happen in a traditional setting. Yeah, and like the stuff I was really interested in, which we, we got to, which I was excited about, was like how his relationship with his daughter has changed, his two daughters. And because I think he's more of a real person than maybe most of the people that have been either in that office or in comparable offices that, you know, if like we went to, if we went to dinner with him, and it was like everything off the record. We'll never talk about any of this stuff again. We make a pact. I think we'd have a really good time at the dinner, yeah, you know? Yeah. And, I, and like, I know people have played golf with him and stuff. And it just seems like he's actually like a, like about as normal of a person as you're going to get. He's going to be the president, whether you agree or disagree yeah. with his beliefs and his stances, all that stuff. I don't know if he's necessarily more of a quote unquote normal person. I mean, like you see that there's a, you know, a, a, a book coming out about the first Bush You've probably seen excerpts about him talking about things, and yeah. now, of course, years later, yeah, he seems of, normal too. You're right. Yeah, I, I think that that there probably is normalcy in all of these people, and like weirdness in all of these people. But Obama is uh, sees that as uh, an important part of his identity that people actually know who he is because he right. seems to have a. a a better sense of certainly he seems to be the funniest president that I can remember. I mean, the way he delivers information and all, you know, yeah, he's like a ball buster. And, uh, you know, I, there were things that I would have, that I, I curious about, like, you know, going before he was elected, one of the principal criticisms of him was that he did not have enough experience. Yeah. And then especially during the first half of his tenure, there was all that sort of obstructionism. He couldn't get anything through. And I wonder if he now says that he was partially at fault for that. If some of the ideas about his lack of experience, the fact that he hadn't managed big coalitions like this and had to sort of make, I wonder if he would say like, well, maybe I was, I wasn't quite ready. Obviously no one's ever ready, but maybe I wasn't. Or if he would say that was not my fault, I was doing the most rational thing. And, a, a, you know, a group on the right just decided to stop everything I tried. Well, he basically and, said that in the interview. He said that he, I, I think he, the point that he was trying to make was, I haven't changed as a person this entire time. I'm as confident as a, a I'm as confident right now as I was in 08. What I didn't anticipate was how hard it was to push things through that I was committed to. And and he admit and now that's basically what you're saying that you're wondering if he felt that way because i think he was completely unprepared for how hard it would be to get anything done and that's the one thing he wishes he had basically told himself in 2008 this is no matter what you think you're going to be able to do you you might not be able to do it the, the but thing that though, i wonder though if he's if i mean there's two ways of looking at that one could say that wishes he could tell himself no matter what you want to do some things aren't going to work or if what he'd tell himself is in order to make this work these things have to be done right in other words he says he hasn't changed at all in eight years but would it have been to his advantage if he was a somewhat different personality i don't know i, th I think i meant like his confidence hasn't changed the, the thing that the one thing i really wanted to talk to him about and we just ran ran out of time basically was I have a feeling, and he hasn't said this yet, and maybe he'll say it to somebody else this last year. I have a feeling he hates how the media works, the structure of the media, and 
just how it's either totally one way or totally the other way. And there's no nuance and no middle ground with a lot of this stuff. And what I wanted to ask him was if you could, if you could fix how the media covers politics, what would you do? How would you fix it? What would be your plan? Because I, I think he, I think he's ready to answer that question. And I just ran out of time. And that but was. That, a, but what would even be a possible plan for that? How can the president? I don't know. See, or fix the media. I, don't, I mean, I don't think he would have offered a fix, but I think it would have given him a window to maybe talk about the media candidly, which I think he wants to do, because. You know, I've talked to John Stewart about this. John Stewart was really worn down by that job. And just how it's it has to be one way or the other way the whole time. And he's just tired of it. You know, you're in that cycle. Just anytime you have any sort of anything that enrages one of the two sides, they come at you really hard. And I just think he got worn down. That was my take from watching. He probably from, did. I mean, you know, it, I mean, the problem is in many ways that we can now measure things that we couldn't measure in the past. Yeah. You know, I mean, the fact that that we have, there's so much statistical proof that people would prefer to consume information that uh, supports their biases as opposed to contradicts them or makes them reconsider them is so overwhelming that any institution that is trying to sort of turn a profit is going to, like, uh, just going to fade in that direction and just start realizing that that their viewership does not want to be challenged on anything. Yeah. It's um, kind of, well, I would have loved to have heard him talk about that. I was interested in that. Um, I was really interested in... He's... He seems like he resonates with celebrities and athletes in a way that maybe some other presidents didn't. And like, I'd love to know like some of the offers he's gotten things to do. Um, think like, like what was the most interesting dinner he's had with a celebrity who's just like, come to my house. We won't tell anyone, blah, blah, blah. He, he just seems like he's in that vortex more than any president we've had. Like, when you think about what Obama is going to do after after he leaves office, couldn't you say that, like, would anything surprise you? Like, if I told you he's going to be the football commissioner in four years, would you be shocked? No, that but but that's a job that uh, that he could take. I mean, it's it's a little tricky when you know when, when let's say when Bill Clinton left office, he people were like he's going to become an actor now. He's going to do all <laughs> right, <this>. uh, <laughs> but you can't really do that. I mean, it's like you know, it's you're no if. It, it's such a rarefied thing to be president. But he's young. If, Obama's young, though. Well, I know, but he still has to sort of, I feel, he'll have a responsibility to sort of respect the position he had. Right. Like, you know, um, that that there's there's certain things you can do. You, he could become the commissioner of the NFL. I think he'd be a great commissioner of the NFL. That's something that he could reasonably do. He could be involved, you know. He, even You're not even supposed to be in the spotlight that much. I mean... Jimmy Carter has had what is, you know, kind of they say he invented the idea of the post-presidency that he did the most yeah. uh, of anyone. Here. Uh, um, but you can't do that in a real public way. That's kind of unseemly. All right. So but let's you, say Obama, let's say he became part of an ownership of an NBA team. And, he, and they gave I mean, him basically like what Magic Johnson did with the Dodgers. But he owns a bigger piece and he owns the Washington Wizards. With Ted Leonsis. Let's say Ted Leonsis says, I'm going to give you 20%. Come be part of my ownership group. Would that be a weird move for a former president? It would be a slightly weird move. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be against it, but it would be a slightly weird move in the sense that one has to assume that having been president, his circle of influence would still be pretty massive. And for one team to have a former president um, owning the, the franchise, uh, that it would seem odd. I mean, I, I do think that once you've been president you kind of give up your right to do certain things in a yeah. weird way it's like that that uh you know you you were the most powerful man in a huge nation in the most powerful nation in the world y you have to be like well okay that happened and now i sort of recede into private i mean so he's gonna know. he'll I mean, do a foundation he'll do a book yeah yeah and he'll then definitely do, he'll probably write multiple books i mean i'm yeah you know, he, he, he's he's going to be like John Grissom. 
<laughs> He's going to be releasing books every every year, or two years. The I, there was one other thing that what did he intimate in that? There was one other. Uh, oh, yeah, I asked him about being a Supreme Court justice, and it was the only time I rattled him in the whole interview for like a split second. He, yeah, he, you go he, like you paused or whatever. Yeah, ah, he, he yeah. froze. And he's a guy that doesn't freeze. He's used to every question. Nobody had asked him that before. And I got to say, like, even when he answered it and was like, no, you know, that would be about, I, I felt like it was in play. I didn't believe him. Yeah. I mean, that would, that would, there again, that's a, that's, that's the kind of job that maybe, uh, and that's another real big job, but it, it falls in line with, um, sort of the prestige of the former office. Okay. Nobody's not, done. Nobody's I, been a president and then a Supreme Court justice. No, no. That would be like, pretty cool. I mean, that like, that puts you on the map. It's like winning an MVP in two in two leagues. Like, I, I'm not saying you should have asked this, but I'm wondering what you think would have happened if you did. What do you think would have happened if late in the interview, you would have asked him a question about like, um, um, have you had any sort of philosophical or personal? discomfort and, and with the idea of using drones in warfare. You think if you'd have brought something up about Ooh. drones, you, like, do you think that that he would have <sighs> just uh, given a safe response? Do you think he just said, like, I'm glad you asked. Here's my response. I mean, I, cause I, 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 it would have been hard for me not to try to ask something like that. The problem is, you know, in my head, I'm thinking 45 to 50 minutes total. Mm -hmm. There's certain questions that you ask him that you know he's not going to answer. And he's just going to filibuster and exactly. he'll waste three, four minutes and he won't actually answer it. And I was trying to avoid those questions. I think if I asked the drone thing, I don't think he answers it. I mean, you think he doesn't answer it at all or he gives an answer that's just like, hey. It, he gives a roundabout answer that doesn't probably. really say anything. Probably. Yeah. Because even when I was asking him about how his administration changed which did, this part didn't make the transcript, but just like, you know, what'd you learn about putting together a team around you? And he went into very careful mode because he didn't want to say anything that would reflect badly on anyone who worked for him in the past. And it turned out to be this roundabout answer that, and that, and that's why, you know, that's what politicians know how to do. They know how to, not, how to give a non-answer basically. It's something that Belichick's great at. You know, we see sports figures are like that too. Belichick and Popovich, they just do it more abruptly. They're just like, I'm not answering next. Yeah. And Belichick's interesting because occasionally someone will ask him a strangely specific question about the, like the craft of defense or whatever, and he'll give the longest, most detailed answer possible. Like, you know, like, right. like they'll be like, okay, you, you want to ask this question about like how we, you know, understand the gap, like the two gap or whatever. It's like, okay, it's going to that. Um, he, wait, hold on, hold that thought for a second. Belichick gave this unbelievable answer last week about Rob Gronkowski as a blocker. And I think this is the frustrating thing about Belichick and Popovich too, is that the guys who hate being interviewed the most are also the most interesting interviews. Cause Belichick gave this two minute soliloquy on how Gronkowski is a great blocker. But if you want to talk about great blockers, it starts with Mark Bavaro. And he goes into this whole testimony about what an unbelievable blocker Mark Bavaro was and how, He's, he could just block Reggie White straight up. He didn't need help. And then in practice, he'd go against Lawrence Taylor. And he's never seen a tight end just be able to take out the other team's best pass rusher by himself and blah, blah, blah. And then he brought, brought it back to Gronk. And he's like, so Gronk's a really good blocker, but a blocker, but I still think Bavaro is the best tight end blocker I've ever, I've ever seen in my life. But that wasn't the question. But I think he's so bored by those press conferences. He's just like, I've been dying to say, make this Mark Bavaro point for five years. I'm just making it. Yeah. Or, it was fascinating. Or, or he spends a lot of time watching film and he sees Gronk block a guy. And in the back of his mind, he's like, well, that was okay. But you know what right. Bavaro would have done there? He'd have got up to the strong safety too. Like he, like, like it's it's something he can't get it. He can't stop thinking about. Because or, wait, or. Life. Or he feels like Gronk is 92% what Bavaro was. And he's like, maybe if I throw this out here, I can get that extra 8%. They just let dangle this Mark Bavaro carrot. It was just so, but that's the thing with the Belichick press conferences. It's like, you know, it, he, it's just, it's just drudgery 99% of the time. And then there's this moment where you're like, oh my God, this is the, easily the most interesting thing I've heard all week from sports. And that's hey, it. I Talk to you a little bit about this cream documentary. Do we yeah, yeah, this? yeah. We have time for cream. <laughs> Before we talk about cream, Chuck, uh, the holidays are coming. 
I know. That means you don't have time to go to the packed post office, find a parking space, stand in line forever, listen to annoying people as they take forever to mail their holidays, gifts, and packages. So why don't you use our buddy Stamps.com? At Stamps.com, you can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter or package using your own computer and printer. Even better, if you sign up for Stamps.com and use the promo code BS, you get a four-week trial plus a $110 bonus offer that includes postage and a digital scale. Go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, type in BS. That's Stamps.com, enter BS. And seriously, it really does suck going to the post office during the holidays. So I encourage I encourage everyone to listen to Stamps.com. All right, Kareem. So I can't think of a better person for us to talk about. You start. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I heard you... Um in the podcast you'd done with Michael Rappaport, and I didn't even know, somehow I didn't even know this Kareem thing had happened, you know, and, and I could I could just sense in your voice that you, you were a little bummed out by it. It wasn't what you had hoped, and I know that you wanted to be good, you know, just for the sake of HBO or whatever, just because you're interested in Kareem. So it kind of lowered my expectations when I watched it. And I did really enjoy it. Like, I, I guess I, I, it could have been longer, and I would have kept watching. I enjoyed but, it, too. I but, thought I uh, made that point clear. Was, I did enjoy it. Yeah. But it was uh, it's it's a it's it's a kind of a flawed documentary. It's kind of like a a very good sports century, and you kind of expect a little bit more in this scenario. Um, but uh, you know, there was just some interesting stuff in it. Like uh, I thought it this 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 isn't even about like this doesn't necessarily say something about Kareem, but just maybe the way all people feel. Um, you know, they're talking about him in in high school, and, and you know he's sitting there and Kareem is like, you know, you know, everybody said that I wasn't going to make it because, you know, I wasn't a big bruiser, that I was too slight. And, you know, this was in the middle sandwich between him, like being on the Ed Sullivan show being right. compared to Will Chamberlain. <laughs> and then the next shot of them saying like every school in the country was recruiting him. Yeah. But that's how it is. You know, it's like, he's like, everybody said this. What that really means is somebody said this and it feels like everybody. And that seems to be uh, for many people, and particularly at Cream, maybe, that his whole life is kind of defined by that. It's not that there was necessarily all these people criticizing him, but somebody was, and it felt like that was everybody else. And that's an interesting thing to me. Well, it's, and the irony of it is the three most famous high school basketball players of all time were Wilt, Kareem, and LeBron. I, I I would well, say that Kareem's the most. Kareem is the most like like LeBron had the highest profile because he's on Sports Illustrated and stuff like that. But there had been other high school kids we'd heard about. When Lil Cinder was in high school, his fame uh, even more so than Will Chamberlain. I mean, it was uh, I I I think that well, those probably, are the three that stand out. Yeah, yeah. Like LeBron was ESPN started showing high school games during LeBron's senior year. I know that was I as I just read Jonathan Abrams. Book and he kind of talks about that whole period. Uh, oh, look but, at you reading my and, boy um, Abrams. Uh, the the thing is though, it's like when LeBron was famous. Remember, this had been many years since like Damon Bailey had kind of been famous as yeah. an eighth grader. Like there, this had happened. Felipe Lopez seemed marginally famous and all this thing. I think that when Kareem was coming up, the idea that the average sports fan would know about a high school kid in New York. I don't think there were, I, that, that that was pretty uh, unique. I don't I don't think there's really any comparison. Yeah, and also the, the New York high school college scene probably mattered more back then. And then Yeah, I mean there was a, I mean certainly the chance if if he had grown up in Omaha, who knows? Yeah. Maybe we left Seattle, that one yeah. we left that one Ewing was on the on par with that too. When Ewing was in college in Cambridge or in high school in Cambridge, I think he was as fa as around as famous as those other three guys. It was a uh, legitimate. That may, that may have been your your prox. I mean, the locality. I mean, like you know, I, I felt. I, I'm not. Sh he was. I remember him being the biggest recruit in the country. But but that by that time that had happened. It seems as though for a long time in in, in college basketball, it was common for people to kind of know. Like I'm saying during the 80s and 90s. Yeah. About one guy every year. That one, there would be a consensus built around somebody, um, and uh, oh, um, like like Marcus Liberty when he went to Illinois or whatever. A lot of time, or Chris Washburn. But there, it was common that there would be one guy that would sort of uh, represent all of the big high school kids coming out. 
And Ewing was definitely kind of in that lineage. No, he was. But, I mean, he had a pretty major press conference when he picked, and he picked Georgetown over BC. That that was like him and Sam. We Samson was like another in one. In Boston, no, it's like I'm sure that. Yeah, was but, that, but he was. Everyone was saying yeah. he was the next Russell. Yeah. You know, when Samson, when was Samson on the cover of SI? Wasn't he in high school? He might have been another one. I don't know if he was. I, I think I, he LeBron was in high school. Was, LeBron was the first high school basketball player on the cover. I was he? I, th- I feel like that that was an Ackerman that happened, and I remember that being like maybe Samson was a freshman. I remember yeah. Samson being on the cover of SI and seeing that he was seven foot four and just not even being able to process it. Yeah, it's like what seven, seven foot four is the Samson thing. It's a, I, the you know there's a, there's a lot of great what ifs in NBA history and and Samson's ranking way up there. Wait a second, we got off track. Kareem, hey, there, there was something about this Kareem documentary that I, I had a I had kind of a crazy idea while I was watching. Yeah, it, what was it? Okay, so they talk about the period when dunking was outlawed, right? Amazing. Yeah, they had to outlaw and, the dunk for Kareem. Yeah, you know, and and there was a, that whole period kind of through David Thompson where that was, you know. Where that were, you know, and, but now, of course, watching this, to me, it is pretty obvious that, in retrospect, this really played to Kareem's advantage. It was great for and, him. In the sense that, that he pretty much had to give up on the idea of just drop-stepping and dunking, so he, had to, he already had the skyhook, but he put together all these other moves, and, and it really refined his game in a way that paid dividends for years down the line. It was fantastic. So, yeah. You know, I'm just thinking, I was, I'm watching a little bit of Duke and Kentucky last night, and, you know, as I've said, it just really bums me out. Like, college game is kind of in dire straits. Like, yeah. the major, the, like, the, the mid-minor, the mid-majors are still okay to watch, but the big teams, like Duke and Kentucky, they kind of seem like just like bad pro teams. So I was thinking, <laughs> okay, it would help the NBA if dunking was outlawed in college. Because these guys would have to sort of work on like a like a different moves, right? It would, it would move the game. They would they would have to sort of specialize their skills. Plus, when they entered the NBA, there would be huge excitement over some guys, and it's like now we can really see him go at it. Right. Like, um, I wonder if it would be uh, in some weird way cool if college basketball outlawed dunking again for the good of basketball as a sport. That's pretty good. I it, I mean, it would be a terrible move from an entertainment standpoint. Tate's laughing me, in the background right now. Are you telling right me Tate... that Shaq would not have been a better pro? And he was a great pro, but he would have been a better pro if he could not have dunked in college? And all he had to do was work on, like, baby hooks and fadeaways? Oh, no, he definitely would have been better. But you could say the same thing about the three-point line. They should make that thing 25 feet now so that, to, so that these guys don't get comfortable shooting 20-footers that count for three points. Uh, well, that way I, I guess I had, I mean, what, what's it in college now? 22 feet. They moved it out a little bit. 22. Who was the guy who dunked at the end of the college basketball game, even though it was a technical and it basically started a riot in the, was uh, it the guy from UNLV and now, who, who, recently, like a couple nights ago. No, this saying? was in the seventies. This was when they, oh. when, well, I think it might've been David Thompson. There was somebody, it was a famous story that got and It was near the end of the game and they were going to win. And it was still technical for a dunk, and this guy dunked at the end of the game, and it like almost caused a riot in the arena. People went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember who it was. I'm pretty sure it was David Thompson. I'm with you though. It does, it does seem like Kareem was a little bit of an outlier, because when they outlawed the dunk, was really the perfect point in his career for them to do that, and it allowed him to do all these different to develop all these different weird finesse moves around the rim that made him even better than he was. And I, I don't see any way that he's not the third best player of all time. Like when I did my book, I was so mad cause he was my least favorite player. I loved rooting against him. And I was so mad that I couldn't come up to any, it couldn't come to any other conclusion than that. He was the third best player of all time. Did was, you have, uh, was Wilt six in your book then? Yeah. I had Wilt Seven? sixth. Six. Okay. Um, so, so, so it was Jordan Russell, Kareem, I think you had Magic. Then Bird and Bird. Magic. Yeah, Magic was four, Bird five. And now I think in Wilt was six. And the LeBron body of work now has probably pushed him past Wilt, I would say. But in, I think, didn't you also say you thought maybe Kobe was top eight? 
Co- yeah, so, Kobe. Right, so it's kind of getting jammed. You're kind of like, remember there was that period where Dick Vitale was like that, where Dick Vitale would say 28 guys. The 28 the diaper three nannies best guys for five spots. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, um, I think what, so Kobe, I think he passed West and Oscar. I think if you're just talking about who had the best career as a guard, I think he's, I think he's passed those two guys. But I think Duncan, if you were going to have two decades of Duncan or two decades of Kobe and you could have them right now as a rookie, who would you pick? Well, I would, I, I, it's a hard one, but I guess I would take Duncan because it's, although, okay, but that by the same token, then would you rather have 20 years or, of Duncan or 11 years of Bird? I mean, that's hard. If you're going to use that, if you're going to use the fact that, that Duncan has been so good for so long, right. um, as, as a way to say that he's greater than Kobe, because with this, you know, I, um, this seems like an argument that we've probably had 80,000 times. I know. Like, it I still comes, enjoy it, though. <laughs> it always comes down to whether or not we're ranking these guys based on the total work of their career, their body of work, or their greatness at the their complex level. Yeah, the ceiling. Well, it's really the ceiling crossed with the breadth of the career, and you have to balance which one matters more. In Bird's case, he really only had nine healthy years. Mm-hmm. And then missed a year and then came back and wasn't really the same. And was, you know, LeBron's, this is amazing, but I think Bird played 13 years. LeBron is in his 13th year. LeBron has never really missed extended time ever and has played more playoff game, way more playoff games than Bird. Well, I mean, Bird had the back, though. If it's not the back, the back. anything else. He fights through it. Well, he had the heels, too. His heels went on him first. But he his body broke playing. down. He would, he would have kept playing through those. LeBron, because he, he, you know, him losing of his first step or whatever, there wasn't much there to begin with. He, if it, it real, because the back is the end for any of these guys. Yeah, it's that's like, true. You, you, you can't be, you know, it's. I, I, I would now be more nervous about a guy getting a back injury than an Achilles injury. It's like Dwight Howard. But, yeah. but part of the problem with this argument, and this is something like I wrote that book in two thousand nine. This is something that's really become apparent over the last five six years. Is the era specific advantages that these guys have now. And it's ludicrous that LeBron could play 20 years at a high level, but it's actually might maybe possibly in play, you know, like even Kobe until his body finally broke down when he had, when his Achilles snapped at the end of what, two seasons ago, whenever that was, that was like year 17 or year 18 for him, you know? And Kareem was really the only person that had succeeded that late in his career. Now you have Duncan still chugging along. You have all these guys. It's like, I don't know what to expect anymore. So then it, now it becomes, how do you rate somebody's career when the modern guys have so many advantages over the guys from the yeah. bird era? But this is also complicates the Kobe Duncan thing because yeah. there is a precedent of front court players playing a long time and being relatively effective. I don't know what, I don't have it in front of me. I bet you'll remember it. I feel like the, in my memory, the last year Kareem played, he averaged like 13 points a game. Is that correct? Right. His no. last year wasn't great. Yeah, but it was like 13.8 for some yeah. reason, I feel like. I'm probably wrong. It probably could be more or less than that. But still, it's like that's pretty late in your life to be sort of out there scoring double digits in a game. What is the precedent for a backcourt player still being able to – I mean, Kobe could score 30 points next week. That could happen, you know, 20 years into his career. Who else is even like that? What, I know, who, but you you have to that? throw away. I think you throw away this year and last year with Kobe. It's just but what I'm saying is that yeah. you can still go. I mean, Jordan, I guess, was like that. Jordan, when he was the Wizards, still had uh, what was his biggest night with the Wizards? He Jordan was better with a, the Wizards than people think he think he was. If you go back well, and look at, I think he was yeah. still averaging 20 a game to the bitter end. He he definitely was averaging 20 points that first year. Uh, he may have yeah. been like. Uh, he may have, may have been like third All NBA. There was that one book the guy wrote that kind of made it seem like he was just terrible because it yeah, didn't every like that bad book. guy he played. No. Um, that book made me uncomfortable. Yeah, uh, but the the thing with uh, I think I blurred it actually. Oh no! You, <laughs> well, remember, no, because I mean, it, it was an interesting book. It was not a book that I uh, that I anticipated reading. I mean, it's just yeah. I you know I, I there are certain guys that I I, I almost read all the books. Like I read all the Kurt Cobain books. I read all the Jordan. Books. Right, right. I, don't, I just do. The thing with the the ceiling thing is interesting though because and this is why my new argument is basically when people are like all right what's your greatest team ever you just pick Bird and Magic and LeBron and and uh, Jordan as four or five and it really doesn't even matter who the fifth guy is 
you know, you're, well, you're beating what, anyone else with those four but, in any but, sense. But is it, is it the purpose of the question to have the five guys? Yeah. Well, I like because we're not you're not playing anyone, so it's like you're kind of like ah, we can throw Artis Gilmore in there. Well, well, sure, but you're not no, no. I mean, I'm I'm talking about there's like seven, eight centers you could put in there that were historically great. And I'm, I'd be okay with almost any of those guys. Like I personally would put Russell with those four and I, and nobody's beating me, mm. but some other people could say, well, what if I put Hakeem in there and now I can, you know, what if I put Shaq and it's just, you could really put anybody with those four guys. You're going to be fine. I think artist Gilmore might be pushing it. <laughs> he who, might slow him uh, down. Who, uh, who is a greater wide receiver? Yeah. Jerry Rice or Moss at his best? Or who at his best? Randy Moss. Rice is the best receiver I ever saw. Okay, I think so that's got to count for... like. Uh, so you're saying for in this kind of magical dream world we in, yeah. for a possession, we have one possession where we need to go... Like, essentially what the Patriots situation they were in against the Giants. Then season. you'd want Moss. Where it's uh, like run 80 yards and beat the two guys that know you're going to run 80 yards and I'm going to throw it as far as I can and hopefully we'll connect. Because the thing is, I mean, okay, by any, if, you, if we use any kind of like body of work metric type thing, well, Rice is not only the best receiver of all time, he's probably the greatest football player of all time. I, I agree. Is, yeah. But we also concede that Moss was bigger, faster, equally good hands very good route runner kind of supernatural in terms of getting the ball out of the air yeah so if somebody is better <laughs> at every quality at their best it's not like it's, i kind of like the argument almost more framed as being who was the best when they were the best i think it's like the ceiling it's, argument it's, like in yeah like in like a uh in, in in the NBA, I always think that's an interesting deal. It's sort of like the best player in the league isn't necessarily the best player on a given possession at their best. Right. And well, I, that's I, the, I you just made the Bill Walton case. Uh, yes, I suppose that, that that's what Bob, Bob Ryan would say. Bob, Bill Walton's best at the center position was the best of any center. But he only got there for a year and a half. Although I, if it was Walton at his best against Kareem at his best. Walton he, took it to Kareem. He did well. Was that Kareem at his best, though? Good question. I don't know. I think Walton was. Then you have to factor in team. You know what you were like as a teammate, how you affected other players. For me, it's like the last level of basketball, and the reason why I, you know, the the six people I have, I would all have over Wilt, is that they were able to bring out something different from their teammates. You know, sure, and that's sure. why I mean, that's that, why I'm so fascinated we'll, by by Ben Simmons. Have you seen Ben Simmons yet? Well, you know, uh, he's only played one game. He's played two. But he, had, he had a pretty good game. He's played I two did. games. Yeah, and plus, you know, he's he's a two now. He's um, he's a six eleven, Magic Johnson basically. And he's raised outside of America, so we won't be corrupted by our secular right. culture. He's yeah, he's, he's yeah, he's wasn't corrupted by the not AAU. That, could, that kind of implies that Australia is not a secular nation, but anyways. Okay. Well, we both yeah. I mean, he's definitely handles himself like a twenty nine year old. But when you watch him play basketball, he, he he's there to to make his teammates better. That's what he gets the most joy out of. And we've seen guards wired like that way, but so rarely do you see forwards. I think LeBron was wired that way from the get-go. Although I got to say that was initially what everybody said about LeBron. And then there was a period when it was like, he doesn't do that. And then it was like, oh, he does because he won this championship. It's like that goes back and forth. It, it does. It does, I, but I, I that situation though. I a scenario where if a few – historical details have changed that Wilt ends up with four championships and a lot of the, especially if Wilt had won one early. Yeah, you could make it. You, there was um, a couple plays that went against him that definitely. had they gone the other way. It's, it's the, the only, Here's the problem with Wilt, though. Everybody from that decade killed him. 
It, it, that was the thing when it, when I wrote the whole chapter about him versus Russell, my book, I was just shocked by how many people went on the record with like, Wilt's a loser. <laughs> Wilt, all Wilt cared about was himself. Wilt was selfish. Wilt didn't understand how to be in a team. It was just over and over again, people oh, who played well, against him yeah, saying that. But there, you know, that's just, it's, it's like in this Kareem documentary, right? When, yeah. when, when Kareem is a high school kid, Wilt like takes him under his wing and brings him to club. But at the end of their life, Will just starts hammering him, and he and, and th there was some, you know, there was, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, you know. Well, like Will that. had a jealousy thing with him, and he had a jealousy thing, and you know, yeah. it's, it's just the thing about the guy who's the most confident is the guy who's the most insecure, over and over and over again. Yeah. And if you look at Will and you look at Bill Russell, we know now that Russell's confidence was real, but Will's confidence was in your face, and that's always Will. <laughs> it's like there's just right. there's something about with, with with very few exceptions that that confidence seems to be what people use as a way to deal with what they fear about themselves and and I think other people saw that you know people killed Will like you say but you know it's like him and Russell were buddies him and Kareem were buddies at some point every you know people I it's it, it just it had to be just how he was to work with I guess. I think the difference between the two, there were two quotes I remember I used in my book. I don't remember the exact wording, but it was basically like Russell used to throw up before games because he was so nervous and fired up for the game. And Wilt thought that was really weird and didn't understand it. And then that kind of symbolized how different they were. Like Wilt, Wilt was like Shaq. Basketball was one of many things he loved to do. Whereas Russell was like, this is all I want to do. And that kind of brings us back to the Brady thing. It is. It's, it's like Brady's like all he wants to do is win. That's he doesn't care about anything else. Like, but it's such a it's such a bizarre thing though the way this works in the world. I mean, okay, for people we don't know who we just watch on TV. Yeah. We want them to be like Russell. We want them to be throwing up like before games and 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 the idea of Will just being like, well, this is one of many things I do that seems like unseemly. But like in life, like what if like. I went out to L.A., and you said, let's go play golf. And, like, three times during the time we played, I threw my clubs into a tree. And I was constantly yelling at myself. That's what it's like to play with me. Yeah, uh, well, I got to say, let's not play golf then. I wouldn't enjoy that, right? <laughs> that's <laughs> like, why nobody plays golf with me. No, I, I don't throw <laughs> clubs anymore. But that's I, why people stop playing golf with me. I, I, I think that the, it, it, it's just this real mysterious thing. This idea that, like, like the thing we love about Brady is actually a uh, – Kind of, or or Jordan or any of these guys is a little bit of psychopathy that is be would be really unlikable to be around, um, but yet we love that as long though as they stay within these strict boundaries that right. are created by. And any time they step outside of that, then it's supposed to nullify everything. Then we're supposed to like you know there's there are people now who well I could see today at, you know get, I write this story right most of the response are from people from Boston who are like, ha, how dare you do this? But there's also a sliver of people who can't accept the idea that Brady's the best quarterback of all time, which I say is my opinion, but it is. Right. You know, it's like, I mean, it's almost how they respond, sort of. It's like, how can you possibly say this? Obviously, he was deflating the balls. Or it's, it's a bizarre thing, man. You know, um, it's, I'm thinking about this is from a parent standpoint. So what you just described, basically... You have the kids who are good athletes, the people that the other parents kind of respect and appreciate are the, are the kids that play a whole bunch of different sports, right? And the ones that are like, all they do is play one sport and they're crazy about it and they're traveling on the weekends. The other parents go, boy, that's weird. Boy, that kid's not going to have a life. Boy, what a strange way. Like, why don't they let, why don't they let the kid, he's going to burn out. Let the kid branch out. But yet when they become pros, it's like, oh, he's obsessed with winning. That's who he is. He's a great leader. <laughs> this yeah, is you awesome. Can have, you, you, you can give up your whole life as long as the middle of your life involves being a professional athlete. Right. <laughs> and then we fine. also assume that the end of their life is going to be horrible because they're going to look back and like nothing matches the crowd. You know, they're, the guy is, you know, by himself drinking alone, wishing it was still the past. You know. Yeah. Well, I, I say that as somebody who, uh, my son's going to be a professional hockey player and I'm all in and I'm going to drive him everywhere he wants to go because he has to do this for us. No, I'm kidding. 
It is. I am entering the whole hockey parent culture scene, which is going to be lead to some fantastic moments of my life. I'm really excited for it. You can't even imagine how crazy the hockey parents are. Well, yeah. I mean, I come from the north. There were. You know, oh yeah, you you can't imagine. What am I saying? Yeah, um, we have I mean, to go. Could, yeah, I suppose we do. We have to go. Uh, you can read Chuck's story in GQ about Tom Brady. What else are you working on? The Taylor Swift thing was great, by the way. I really enjoyed oh, it. Thanks, thanks. You um, did a well, good job know, with that. Um, I, I'm having another kid in January, and I finished my last book. That will come out next year. So I'm kind of just, I'm kind of being cool for the rest of this year. I'm All right. Will you watch to... some Ben Simmons? Oh, I absolutely will. I All right. Absolutely will. I have a lot at stake with this one because the Celtics have Brooklyn's pick. He has my last name. There's just a lot going on. And and he has the bird magic passing gene. And I don't know where all this is leading, but I'm very excited about it. But check him out. I think uh, this is the first college basketball player that I'm genuinely excited about since Kevin Durant at Texas, who yeah. I watched probably 20 of the 30 Kevin Durant games. Yeah, but then I feel like you went through a long stretch while not watching anyone. I, college to me is I'm watching the players. College is a sport now where the coaches are the stars, which is like... Oh, great. There's John Calipari in a suit again. How is that attractive to me as, as a viewer? I want to see talent. I want to see great players. I want to see awesome, you know, other than that, I'm just going to watch the tournament. I'm not going to, like yesterday, I didn't really care about watching that Kentucky game. So I'm going to watch bad basketball. I'd rather watch NBA basketball. There was also Mac football on. That was I awesome. forgot about that. All right. That's what I was watching. Chuck, time. as always, a pleasure. Check out Chuck at C. Klosterman. At C. Klosterman. And uh, before we go, the BS Podcast is brought to you by Stamps.com. Remember, it's holiday season and your post office is about to turn into a scene from The Walking Dead. Don't deal with those package mailing zombies in your neighborhood. Stay home, use Stamps.com, print your own postage, and use your own computer and printer. With the promo code BS, you get a four-week trial plus a $110 bonus offer. That includes postage and a digital scale. Go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in BS. Stamps.com, enter BS. And don't forget to subscribe to Channel 33. That's our new podcast from the BS Podcast Network that features former Grant Landers, Chris Ryan, Andy Greenwald, and Juliet Littman, along with some players to be named later. And don't forget this weekend, HBO Pay-Per-View, Saturday, November 21st, Miguel Cotto, Canelo Alvarez. I will be in the house. Very excited for that. Uh, and you can subscribe right now to Channel 33 and to the Bill Simmons Podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. Thanks, as always. Play some to Buck. We about this bitch. Anytime y'all want to see me again, rewind this track right here, close your eyes, and pick